start today's yeah, proceedings. Yeah. So today is the sixth and final lecture in this series on Nobel Prize, Nobel Prizes 2022. Today is also 10th December when Nobel Prizes are awarded. And I'm told that the ceremonies have started two days ago. So I also urge all of you to log on to the Nobel Prize um, website and attend these ceremonies. They are very beautiful. So once again, welcome to all for today's lecture, especially thanks to you, Methali, for joining us today on this forum. And thank you to all the speakers and guests of honor and now I request Mr. Dharambi to extend a form, formal welcome. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I welcome Matsuniji, Professor Grover, Professor Arun Kumar, and all other distinguished participants for being with us on this lecture, the last lecture under the Nobel Prize series. Professor Matleji, sir. Uh, Ms. Matleji is a distinguished uh, economist and the consulting editor of the famous Economic Times, which we read almost every day. And Professor Arun Kumar is a distinguished economist of Jawaharlal Nehru University. So with this, I'd like to hand over the stage to Professor Grover to conduct the session. Thank you, Professor Grover, please. Good morning, all. <clears throat> I welcome all of you to today's lecture on Nobel Prize in Economics by Mathleji in the presence of our guest of honor, Professor Arun Kumar. At the outset, I thank Guru Arun Kumar, who, who has delayed his departure from Jaipur to Delhi so as to be with us online for today's lecture. SPSTI is particularly indebted to Professor Arun Kumar for helping us in sourcing out suitable eminent speakers for delivering lectures on Nobel Prize in, in Economics for the last three years. In the year 2020, he spoke to Professor Krishnendu Ghosh Dastidar, and in 2021, he spoke to Professor Ravi Shirivasana, both of them his colleagues at JN, JNU, to speak at our forum. Today's speaker, Mathli Ji, has also been motivated to speak at SVSPI forum by Arunji. I'm just tempted to share with all of you that like Professor Arun Kumar, I had also toyed with the idea of leaving physics and pursue a career in management and financial sector while doing PhD at TIFR, <laughs> Mumbai in 1970s. I had gained admission into IIM Bangalore for an MBA degree in 1976, but I eventually did not join there. <clears throat> While pursuing physics at university level, I had been fascinated by both Professor Richard P. Feynman, who was awarded Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965, and Professor Paul A. Samuelson, who was awarded Nobel Prize in Economics in 1970. Both of them were living legends, and the textbooks they wrote for undergraduate students were read all over the world by all students, whether you are in economics, physics, whatever. So if I bought Feynman lectures in physics for my first book grant from NCRT in 1968, I bought Samuelson's book on economics from my first book grant at TIFR in 1972. I did get an opportunity to practice management at the end of my career as a physicist, while I was inducted to serve as VC of PU in 2012. Universities are body corporates in the domains of education. I am fascinated with Mathliji's choice of the title for our presentation, Understanding the Economics Noble, How Does It Impact Our Lives? Like all of you, I'm looking forward to listen to him as well as to brief experts' comments by Arunji. Thank you all, and here I conclude. Back to you, Kia. Thank you very much, Professor Grover, for giving that brief on this lecture series. Now I request 
professor vinod choudhury from department of sociology punjab university chandigarh to introduce today's guest of honor professor vinod choudhury thank you thank you all uh, uh, it's my humble duty to introduce uh, professor arun kumar grover uh, arun kumar joined jnu in 1984 the year i born and he retired as a sukhmani chakravarti chair professor in the center of uh, for economic studies and planning jawaharlal nehru university in 2015 he is currently the maclom uh, adishias chair in institute of social sciences he has a phd in economics from uh, jnu and master in physics from uh, princeton university usa and new delhi delhi university he is a gold medalist of uh, delhi Professor Chaudhary, there's something wrong with your audio. It, there's a lot of echo. Switch off your video. His PhD is in ninety two on uh, inflation and terms of trade. Give a new understanding for the role of trade and government in uh, inflation in India. His book, The Black Economy in India, published in by Penguin nineteen ninety nine. Uh, another edition was in two thousand two and two thousand seventeen. He has uh, broken new ground in thinking about Indian economy. He has published a book titled Challenges. facing indian universities 2004 and written extensively on issues pertaining to higher education in india he was president of jnu teacher association in for 2014 his book titled indian economy since independence persisting colonial disruption 2013 present a holistic analysis for current indian societies development by taking a long term view and combining together the historical political social and international developments in february 2017 he has published understanding black economy and black money in india an inquiry into causes consequences and remedies in uh, december 2017 he published demonetization and black economy analyzing demonetization in february 2019 ground uh, scorching tax analysis gst both are published by uh, Penguin Random House. He has written extensively on globalization and its impact on Indian society, and on issues of political policy. He has published article both in academic journal and in popular press. Contributed to public discussion on uh, policy since 1980s. He was uh, the vice chair of Manifesto Drafting Committee of uh, National Forum in 1989. and the convener of uh, economic and ecology committee of up 2013 he authored the alternative budget in 1993 94 and 94 to 95 which proposed alternative economic policies for the country this was presented before a citizen assembly of eminent citizen of the country he was a member of uh, the group producing the alternative economic survey for two decades which provided an alternative analysis of official data he was the group leader of the committee for uh, pricing of uh, sukhoi 30 mki he was a member for the first pay commission of tibetan government in exile he has participated in various social movement for uh, from time to time like uh, in housing rights so that was a brief introduction of uh, professor uh, arun kumar and we are listening him continuously on television and uh thank you thank you vinod ji i request professor arun kumar to give his address professor arun kumar 
Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thanks, Vinod, for that introduction. Uh, thanks, Arun, for organizing all this and for chairing this session. Now, this prize that we are discussing in economics, we'll hear Maitri speak a lot on it, but you know, just very briefly, it's about the financial markets, which is broader than just banking. So it's not just banking, because on the basis of money, you create finance. You know, that's something that we need to uh, understand. And the idea of stability, stability, not only of banks, because of course that affects all of us, but of the financial structures. And we've had problems with the financial structures for quite some time. Uh, ben Bernanke, who's one of the Nobel Prize winners, was the chief of the Federal Reserve Bank of the USA. And uh, he had worked on the economic history aspect that during the period of the depression, what happened to banking and what were the problems that the banking system faced. Now, when he took over, uh, he faced the challenge of the financial crisis, you know, the, the instability in the financial system because there were shadow banking, subprime crisis and so on that had come up. Now, why did that come up? That came up because during Alan Greenspan's time, who preceded Ben Bernanke, Alan Greenspan was the Fed chief for 16 mm -hmm. years before Ben Bernanke took over in 2006. Uh, the stock markets rose dramatically. There was instability growing, but Alan Greenspan, when he was asked that why doesn't the Fed intervene to try and stabilize, he said that markets are self-correcting. That means they will automatically take care of things. You don't need to actually do the uh, uh, you know, uh, intervention and regulation in that uh, period. Uh, so you know, uh, when Alan Greenspan was asked in the Senate hearings in 2008, once the financial crisis really blew out of proportions, uh, then he said, I was wrong. And Alan Greenspan was treated as God by the financial market because the financial markets were doing very well. So in a sense, you know, the financial markets proved that God was wrong because Alan Greenspan was the God for the uh, financial markets. Now, in this context, it's important to note that Hyman Minsky, uh, one very well-known economist of uh, financial systems and so on, he in 1977 had a model showing that actually there's a bubble, that financial markets create bubbles, and these bubbles can burst. So when in 1987, on Monday, the markets collapsed, you know, people said, is this what you had predicted? He said, no, it'll be worse than this. Then in 1997, there was the global contagion, you know, starting with Southeast Asia. And people asked him, is this what you had predicted? He said, it'll be much worse than this also. He unfortunately died before the 2007 crisis. And in 2007, the crisis was uh, even uh, deeper. So, you know, the, the economic history that Ben Bernanke uh, looked at during the depression period, and he talked about banking and, you know, the, the instability in the banking system, uh, that did not come to the aid of trying to prevent this uh, global crisis that took place. The other two, Divip and the D Diamond, they have got theoretical models and they talk about how multiple equilibria are created in the banking system and that causes instability and that causes problems. So how do we understand that? And we go back to Keynes. Uh, Keynes said that money actually creates the new uh, dimensions. You know, So he says, that the revolution that took place in uh, economics uh, it was because of money. And why was it so? Because now demand becomes an issue. Earlier, it was supply that was an issue, which is what the sales law said. But now demand is a problem, and demand is the one that actually uh, creates the system uh, in the economy. And what was the system? That savers and investors become different people. When it was all without money, the savers and investors are the same. If savers and investors are different people, then banks are needed to intermediate between them. That is what the Nobel Prize winners have also uh, argued, that the role of the banks is to intermediate between the savers and the investors, because these are two different people. So savings are done by a large number of people, and investors are few. So banks then provide the money that the savers save uh, to the investors for investing in the economy. Now, in this context, if all the money that is saved is also invested, then a great deal of instability takes place and there could be a run on the bank and the banking system could also collapse. So here comes the role of the central bank in regulating and the role of the cash reserve ratio in seeing that they don't lend all the certain amount of certainty that is provided by the central bank, by the cash reserve ratio. So this security that comes with regulation, 
this idea of security was actually advanced by the Nobel Prize winners uh, when they, uh, you know, talked about the need for regulation and the need for, you know, these kind of problems to be sorted out. But what has happened is the shadow banking started. Now, shadow banking, there's no regulation. And that's what Alan Greenspan had not uh, tackled. So because of the shadow banking, the problems came, the subprime crisis came, and the subprime crisis resulted in the uh, huge crisis that took place. So Ben Bernanke's model or the model of the Nobel Prize winners did not help us sort out the issue of why the financial markets collapsed in 2007 to 2009. So uh, money and financial market instability is due to excessive speculation, which is what Hyman Minsky was talking about. It was about the bubbles that get created and these bubbles can then burst. So for instance, today, even though the global economy is about $100 trillion, the financial markets are probably 20 times larger. So, you know, the daily trade may be, you know, a, 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 a small amount, but the financial markets are in trillions of dollars, you know. So, therefore, the financial markets have, uh, you know, greatly superseded or uh, they are far greater than what the real economy is. And that's why this argument was given that Wall Street over Main Street, that the Wall Street represents the financial and Main Street represents the production in uh, industry, production in agriculture and so on. And that's why this idea was given after the 2007-2008 crisis that Wall Street dominates over the Main Street. And an example of that was that when AIG, the biggest uh, insurance company that was failing, the US go government provided it $350 billion of aid within three months. But when General Motors, which employs two times more than the AIG was failing, it wanted $25 billion, but it was not given $25 billion. And six months later, the entire automobile industry was given $25 billion. So this domination of the financial markets, the instability that has come, that is something that is troubling the uh, world economy. And therefore, theory, in my judgment, is not yet clear how to tackle these instabilities in the financial markets, in the banking uh, system, and so on. And especially now, we know that another bubble is built up because of the digital currency, because of the kind of cryptos that are coming in. If you think about it, the Bitcoin that was started, you know, in 2009, uh, to buy one pizza of $4, you had to spend 10,000 Bitcoins. And then by November 2021, it had become $60,000. That means the value of the Bitcoin had increased by 100 million times. This is a huge bubble that has been created, you know, and that is causing further instability in the world economy. So in other words, the work is in progress about banking and finance and about how instability has been created and what to do about this uh, excessive speculation that keeps appearing from time to time. So the, the Nobel Prize winners have actually gone to a certain extent, but a lot more work needs to be done. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Professor Arun Kumar, for giving us the background in such a succinct manner. And Bitcoins, we still have to hold that lecture. Thank you. And now I request Professor Sanjeev Sharma, founder of University Institute of Applied Management Sciences of Punjab University, Chandigarh, to introduce today's speaker, Sanjeev Ji. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, uh, I deem it my pleasure to have been uh, assigned the pleasant duty of uh, introducing Madam Maithili uh, as part of the series on uh, the Nobel Prizes 2022. Uh, Ma'am uh, she wears uh, multiple hats. Right? She has been an economist turned banker turned journalist. Uh, she is uh, currently the consulting editor at uh, ET Now, the TV channel of the Economic Times, and hosts a weekly program uh, titled Macros with Maithili. Uh, she has been working with the Economic Times uh, since 2006, other than writing editorials, uh, mostly on issues related to Mac Macroeconomics, finance, and banking. She also writes a regular uh, column titled Finance Street for the editorial page, as well as blogs regularly on the online edition. After working for almost um, 16 years with the State Bank of India, starting as a probation officer, and later uh, with the Reserve Bank of India, Madam Maithili moved to journalism in 1993. She has edited the editorial page of Economic Times for four years. She joined uh, uh, Financial Express in 2004 and became the first woman editor of the Business Daily. 
Uh, she has served as a consultant to Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, as well as a senior consultant and later senior advisor at the National, uh, National Council for Applied Economic Research from 2013 to 2017. Uh, she holds a master's degree in economics from Delhi School of Economics and is a certified associate of Indian Institute of Bankers, besides holding a, a degree in law from University of Delhi. She has also been a moderator for Foundation for Advanced Management of Elections. Uh, she is a visiting faculty with Delhi, uh, Delhi University as well as Great Lakes Institute of Management. She has been on the advisory board of KIT School of Management. Uh, and uh, is, thus, she is a perfect choice to share uh, with us the salient features of the contributions of the uh, Nobel laureates in economics for the year 2022, uh, which are basically in the domains of banks and financial crisis. Uh, let me share with my uh, august uh, audience that uh, Madam Maithili has a very lucid and uh, style and she has a penchant for uh, one-liners. Uh, in fact, I was just going through it that uh, uh, in, in many of the management um, uh, faculty, we often use her titles for interaction with the classes for dissecting the emerging business environment. Uh, allow me to share some of the titles of her uh, papers. She writes uh, an honest letter from RBI to Sita Raman titled Chokidar Reserve Bank. Am I right, ma'am? That was the title. Uh, then uh, she, she wrote another title, uh, GDP numbers will shape the budget, but will the government be able to read them? Uh, another one is uh, even more fascinating, uh, Economist in the Wonderland. Uh, then she writes, uh, mudding the GDP waters. We need informed discussion and not politicization of GDP numbers. Uh, in fact, the icing is that uh, tighten your seat belts. When she was writing on uh, the U.S. sanctions uh, on Iran, uh, subtly highlighting that it is going to be a rough ride for us in India also. Uh, and um, another uh, masterpiece is when she uh, titled it, uh, Where Elephants Trump Dragon. That was uh, when uh, there was uh, economic competitiveness between the two Asian giants. So, uh, ma'am, indeed, it is uh, befitting that such a stalwart of the stature of uh, Professor Arun Kumar, uh, welcome, Adi Shishaya, Professor, has uh, been the guest of honor for us. So, uh, we uh, we welcome ma'am Maithili and we request her to share her views, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sanjeev Sharma. Now, I request Maithili to start her talk. Uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Sanjeev, for actually having taken the trouble of going through all my tongue-in-cheek and not very diplomatic headliners. And as you know, <laughs> one will understand the difference between journalists and scientists. And thank you also to the Society for Promotion of Science and Technology. And I think the other organizers of this you know, seminar, I think it's a great idea. Thank you to both the Aruns. In fact, I'm pretty overawed because you know, I've never really had to kind of talk in front of so many people who are academics and who are, you know, have a scientific, scientific background, really. So it's really, and that's why it's quite amused in a way to find myself being described as distinguished, eminent, et cetera, et cetera, because these are not, not you know, descriptions that is normally given to journalists. Journalists are called, you know, very left of center, right of center, very harsh, cynical, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really overawed to, to kind of get this kind of introduction and I only hope I live up to your expectations. So with that, thank you also, Arun. You all, almost give, made my task very easy because you described the background in which this Nobel has been given. So with that, maybe I can just start by screen sharing because I do want to try and leave time for question answers, if any and also you know, try and finish in time because it is a very vast area. So maybe with that brief introduction, start my screen sharing. I think maybe we can take questions at the end. That might be a little better. I might go a little fast depending on the time, but I'm always open to question answers later, either by email or of course, if we have time now itself. So I'm starting my screen and please let me know if you can see if it's, you know, if it's, can you see it? Is that okay? Yes, we can see. Yeah? Okay, fine. So I'm, I'm just starting right away saying about the, you know, the Nobel Prize in economics. In fact, what is interesting is not only is this the last Nobel Prize, and as Kaya said, we're giving it today, ironically, on the day of, you know, I think, uh, what human 
I, I think Professor Goman talked about it as human rights or something, the celebration of human rights. And economics really is about essentially much more about human rights than really about any other kind of science. So what is interesting really about the economics Nobel in comparison to other Nobel prizes is this is something that Alfred Nobel never thought of giving. In fact, this was instituted much later by the Swedish Central Bank precisely because they felt that you need to have a Nobel Prize for something that is so important in human lives. So this is the third thing, the first thing that one must note that the economics Nobel has not been instituted by Alfred Nobel. It has been instituted by the Swedish Central Bank in the memory, of course, of Alfred Nobel. And as I said, I think you're familiar with the names of all the people. Ben Bernanke, now with Brookings Institution, formerly with, he was Fed Chair, and of course, many other things that you can read about. We have Douglas Diamond, and then we also have Philip Divick from Washington University. And what did they get this for? In fact, this is the first time I think I'm feeling reasonably confident, I say reasonably confident, in describing the work done by Nobel Prize economists, because of the first time I think they talk, they've been given work for something that I can relate to, because I, even though my grounding is in economics, I've not really been an academic. And many of the Nobel Prizes that have been given in the past have been given for cutting edge developments in economics that are more in the realm of mathematics, perhaps even you know, things like computers, et cetera, and didn't really have much immediate relevance to the everyday life that we are dealing with. So this time for a change, they've given it for research on banks and financial crises. So why is this important? Let me move down. Um, let me screen share one minute. Yeah. So what kind of research are we talking about? The press release from the Academy says that the trio have significantly improved. I'm reading this in case it's not very clear, but I'm sure all of you can read it. For, un for improved our understanding of the role of banks in the economy, particularly during financial crises. And an important finding of their crises is why avoiding bank collapses is vital. Actually, this is a little intriguing because I thought the role of banks in the economy, especially during financial crises, was well understood even earlier because we've had a number of financial crises. I said, particularly banking crises. I know Arun spoke about that we're not going to talk only about banks. We're going to talk about financial crises because the financial sector is much larger than the banking sector. But there's a reason why I'm going to focus on the banking sector, not only because the Nobel has been given for work in banking, but as I hope to explain in the course of my talk, banking perhaps encompasses much, much more than just banking per se. It has implications for the financial sector in a way that the insurance sector, the pension sector, the capital markets really does not have. And I'll explain why as we go along. So, but as I said, the banking crises are not new. We had banking crises right from the 18th century, 19th century. In fact, the 20th century, the Great Depression was far, far worse than what we saw of the crisis of 2008, 9, 13, 14. These are actually, you know, piddly crises, pygmy crises. Sorry, my language is that of a journalist. So these are really not new at all. So despite that, why did the Nobel Prize Committee give a, you know, to work, uh, award the prize for research in banking. Why did we not learn in two centuries worth of crises that we've had? Why did we not learn from them? Let me just now turn to Wikipedia. I know in the academic world, particularly among scientists, Wikipedia is an absolute no-no. But I think for those of us who are not pure scientists, Wikipedia has come to encompass a great deal of, I wouldn't say accuracy, but it does because of its automatic correction for editing, give you a reasonable, idea of what the truth, quote unquote, somewhere lies. So what does Wikipedia say? Because that I find is a very succinct kind of explanation. It's a financial crisis that really affects banking activity. But banking crisis is much, much more. A bank run in which effectively means when do, what do we call a bank run? Is that when you go to the bank and ask for your money and the bank tells you, sorry, I can't give you back your money. And everybody comes rushing to the bank to try and take, get their money out. And the bank says, we cannot honor our obligations. This can affect either a single bank, but as we go on, and go on, I'll show you why a bank run can never be limited only to a single bank. Because of the interconnectedness between banks and the financial system, usually we have what is called the domino effect. If one bank which is large enough goes down, it can pull down the entire banking system. And when the entire banking system goes down, it can pull down not just your domestic economy, but as we saw in the 2008 crisis, it can pull down the entire world economy. 
So that is what we say when you talk about a systemic effect. Very often people say systematic, it is not systematic. If the word is systemic, that means it affects the entire system. And then you, and banks as a result of this, banks, corporates, everybody, they're not able to honor their obligations. And then you have the rise of what has now become a very popular word. Maybe 10 years ago, an average man in the street would not have heard of NPAs. But today, almost everybody knows what NPAs are and why they're troubling us, et cetera, et cetera. So this really is what financial crises and banking crises can do. So why is the sudden as interest, as I said, in bank and bank failures? And this, I think, is something that I've already spoken about, because what happened essentially was the 2008 crisis, because what happened was the Great Depression. I think none of us today is, was there alive during the, 2000, the Great Depression of the early 19th, 20th century. But today we know that what has happened is a 2008 crisis brought home to us very graphically what can happen when a large enough bank goes under, how not only the US economy, but the entire world economy virtually capsized. So I think suddenly now the importance of banking crisis has come to the fore and hence the interest of the Nobel Prize you know, committee in giving the award to these two, the trio really. I'll not step into the very you know, politically air, dangerous area or why the Nobel Prize is increasingly decided what why the Western powers want. That's a completely debate for another day. I just happened to mention it because, as I said, I'm a journalist, and journalists are always creating controversy and trouble wherever they go. But the fact is that the 2008 crisis graphically brought home the problems of the financial sector. And this was a crisis that affected the US economy very dramatically. So hence, I suppose, the greater interest of the Nobel Committee also in awarding the prize to the trio. So very, I'm just digressing a little bit. Why do we need financial markets at all? The main role really is to intermediate. That means to play like, be, become like a broker between savers and investors. Now, why is this important? Because savings is very important for investment. But if we didn't have this intermediate agency of financial markets and financial sector players, then the savers would not know whom to lend to. The borrowers who want to invest would not know where to go to get the money. And I would not know, I as a saver would not know who is a wise investment, who is a borrower, who is credit worthy, who is not. Similarly, the investor would not know where to tap money. And he wants large pools of money. It is very inefficient for him to go from saver to saver to find out. So the in financial markets plays this very important role of intermediating. That means bringing savers and investors together in the, and borrowers or investors together. And this role is very important because we need savings and investment, which is for which is for economic growth. If you have economic, if you want economic growth, and I think all of us want economic growth, regardless of whether you're a rich country or a poor country like India, we all want economic growth, not only to bring material prosperity, but also hopefully to improve the quality of life. And this is particularly important for a country like India where we have a large number of people below poverty line, and we desperately want to increase the size of the pie, as also bring about a more equitable distribution of the pie. So the ability of the financial sector to intermediate and to do this job efficiently is very critical to economic growth. So this I said, you can just read this, that everybody organizations need growth, they need funds, and they need the funds not only to buy their long-term assets, but also for what I call their working capital, to bridge the gap, sometimes what happens, even government of India, as you can see, sometimes government has to spend. In fact, very often government has to spend first, the revenues come later. So you have to bridge the gap between inflows and outflows. This is where the financial sector comes in. And as I said, now it's very popular to talk of data being the new oil. But if data is a new oil, as I'd like to say, finance is the oldest oil of all, because nothing moves without finance. Virtually nothing moves without finance. It is necessary to grease the oils, the wheels of the economy. So this is very briefly, this is something that is not related really strictly to today's talk, but I thought it's useful to give you a very brief background that you have different segments of the financial markets and each segment caters to a different kind of activity. So you have capital markets, et cetera, et cetera. You can very briefly read this, but I'm going to focus essentially on credit markets and the banking system, which caters to the credit markets. So here again, I've just for your own in interest, in case you're interested, I'll leave this PPT with you, I'll send it over to Arun and he can give it to Arun also, Arun Grova, and then you can keep it. But basically we're going to focus on banks and in the Indian context, the regulator of the Reserve Bank of India, who's also the central bank of the country framing monetary policy. So let's start with what exactly is banking. So for that one must go to the statute and the statute which governs this 
is something that is known as the Banking Regulation Act, framed as far back in 1949. And even though we've seen amendments to various acts, it is a credit of the BR Act that the 1949 definition still holds. There's been no need to change this regulation and how this act, the term wording of the act. So what is banking? It means accepting for the purpose of lending or investment, deposits of money from the public, repayable on demand or otherwise, and withdrawable by check, draft, order or otherwise. And I'm reading this because I want you to particularly take note of two or three words, rather four words maybe, accepting for the purpose of lending or investment. Deposits of money from the public. That means banks are free to source money from anybody. I, as an individual, cannot go and tap money from the public at large because I'm not a bank. So only banks can accept from the public at large for the purpose of lending and investment. But this is repayable on demand. So that is another very critical aspect of banking, that not only can they take money from the public, they must use it for lending or investment, but they must also be in a position to repay that deposit on demand. And this is what makes banking very, very challenging. So there are basically two facets to banking. You take deposits of money from the public, you use it for lending or investment, and on the face of very simple, you take money, lend. What is so difficult about it, right? But banking, as I said, is a lot, lot more complex. The reason for this mainly is because bank deposits are withdrawable on demand, whereas loans typically are not repayable on demand. They're made for fixed periods. So take an example. You have deposited money in your bank. You have a salary account. You have opened a savings bank. You put, say, 10,000 rupees in that. I put the deposit today. Tomorrow, I can... It is perfectly legitimate for me to go to the bank and say, yesterday I gave you 10,000 rupees. Today I want to withdraw 5,000 rupees. I want to, with or I want to withdraw 9,000 rupees. But meanwhile, what has the bank done? The bank has got this 10,000 rupees. So the bank has lent because your neighbor has gone to the very same bank and asked for a housing loan. So the bank has given this money. I'm making it very simple. So it's, not, it's simplistic, but this is somehow, just bring the point home to you dramatically. So the bank has already given your money to your neighbor for a housing loan. Now, housing loans, you know, are typically given for 20 years, 30 years, maybe even more. So when you go to the bank, the bank cannot tell you, sorry, buddy, I've already given the money to your neighbor for a housing loan. And he will give it back to me entirely only after 30 years. He'll give it to me in the way of EMI, equated monthly installments, but that will also take some time. So I cannot give you back your money. The moment you hear this, You'll say, oh my God, kya hua? you go running back and you tell your neighbor and all your neighbors who listen to me that I've gone to X bank and asked for my money. The bank says, sorry, I can't give it back to you. So you better go to the bank and get your money back. So soon you'll have an entire collection of people in front of the bank door say, give me back my money, give me back my money. And that is how bank runs happen. So this is why the job of a bank is also described as one of maturity transformation. What does this mean? That means a bank takes a deposit, which is withdrawable on demand. So next minute itself, you can take it back. So that is a majority of a deposit. Can be one day, five days, six days, et cetera. But they are lending it for much longer. So they take something on short-term deposits and they lend it on a longer-term basis. So what the bank does is really maturity transformation. So maturity transformation, but it automatically gives rise to risk. This risk is reduced to some extent by the magic of what we call fractional banking or modern banking. So what is fractional banking really? So fractional banking is what happens is that all of you are scientists and most of you, I'm sure all of you know mathematics and statistics, et cetera. So you know that by the law of large numbers, what happens is that when banks get a large amount of deposits, they know over a period of time that not everybody is going to take back their money and not everybody is going to take, on, take back all their money. So they know it's quite okay. They keep a small amount of money, the approximate amount they'll calculate over a period of time by experience. Only that much do they need to meet their daily requirements of depositors asking for their money back. The remaining money, they don't need to keep idle because if they kept it idle, they're not going to make any money out of it. And the banks, after all, are commercial entities. They also need to make profit. So what do they do? They keep aside a small amount of money, which is enough to meet the demands of people who want to withdraw. And the remaining money they lend out. They lend out maybe for a much longer period. So this really is what banking is all about. And it's nothing very magical in a way. Money lenders learned this way back in the 16th and 17th century. Because before we had the rise of modern banking, 
What did people do when law and order was much worse? I hope it is, was much worse than what we are facing now. People typically didn't want to keep their money in their house because they feared theft. So they gave their money to the local money lender. Please keep this safe. And the money lender kept it safe. Now, what is a money lender going to do with it? He's a money lender after all, right? So this money he was lending out. But he also knew that you might come back tomorrow and ask for your money. So money lenders, as we know, are smart people, much smarter than you or I. So they realize it is not enough, it's not necessary for me to keep all the money. So the money lender said, okay, I'll keep your money safe. And he knew that you're unlikely because those days money lenders particularly knew the entire community. Today, banks don't know their customers at all. Even though we have KYC norms, know your customer norms, the fact is that modern banks really don't know their customers. But in earlier terms, money lender knew everything about you. So he knew that you're unlikely to see that there is something in your house, so he know ki inke ghar mein bhi kuch nahi hone wala. So he know this money you're not likely to ask back for it. So money lender started keeping aside only a small fraction and lending out the rest. And that's how they made money. So that really is the origin of modern banking. So what is the other side of doing this? The flip side of the fractional reserve system is multiple credit creation. Now this is why we call banks jadugars in some way, because what do they do? The credit extended by one bank becomes a deposit for the other bank. Now, the other bank has, again, because of the fractional reserve system, he is able to keep aside only a small fraction of these deposits and lend the rest. So over a period of time, we have what is known as multiple credit creation. And because bank money is recognized as as good as money, we have what, the ability of the banks to create credit out of almost thin air. So that is why banking becomes so critical, not only because they are intermediating between savers and investors or borrowers, but also because banks have this unique ability to create credit on a much larger scale than the initial deposit. So given this kind of power of banks, obviously we need to do something about regulations. We'll come to that a little later. So banking by another name, one name I said is maturity transformation. The other name really is that banks are in the business, business of managing risks because maturity transformation automatically means that there is a risk. I have to give my money, money back to my depositor the moment he demands it. Even in the case of fixed deposits or term deposits, even though we know that it may be for four years, five years, et cetera, all of us know that today we can go and encash our fixed deposits. We might have to pay a penalty, but we can liquidate our fixed deposit at any point of time. So banks know that depositors' demands have to be acceded to immediately. But I cannot possibly lend money for a house and tell the, below, the borrower that, look, I've given you this money, 30 lakhs, 40 lakhs to build your house. But tomorrow, if my depositor asks me for my, the money, you have to do give me back the entire money. That is not possible at all. So banking is essentially not just maturity transformation. It's also the business of managing risks. But why do banks do this? Why do banks do this very risky business? Because they want to make money. Banks are in the business of making money. But the danger is that in this desire to make money, how do you ensure that the bank does not take riskier and riskier assets or does not give riskier and riskier borrowers finance them simply because the higher the risk, the higher the interest rate that you can charge the borrower. As we saw in the 2008 crisis, which is known as a subprime crisis really, US banks essentially were lending to borrowers who they should not have lent to at all in the first place. But because they were these very risky borrowers, you could charge them a very high rate of interest. So the spread or the difference between the rate of interest that the bank was charging the borrower and the rate of interest that the bank was giving the depositor, that which is called the spread of the bank, became very large. And banks ultimately, greed is the bottom of all finance. If there was no human greed, maybe you wouldn't have human society at all. You certainly would not have finance, right? So banks are in the business of making money. So there's a tendency, there's an incentive to lend to riskier and riskier borrowers at higher and higher rate of interest. Because as you know, higher the risk, higher the rate of interest, which is why we say that the sovereign government of India in our context is risk-free. Sovereign borrowing is a benchmark because sovereign borrowing is risk-free. Why is this risk-free? Because a sovereign alone has a right to print money. The sovereign will never default. It can default on external obligations, but as far as your rupee debt is concerned, government of India will never default because they are the sovereign. They can always print money. So the sovereign borrowing is a benchmark 
is a risk-free rate of return. Beyond that, depending on how risky the borrower is, you will go on adding premium, depend for risk premium, right? So this is why banks, you have to ensure, how do banks take risks? And how do they ensure that, the, how does the public, the regulator who acts on behalf of the public, ensure that these risks are kept within modicum limits? So, okay, so this sounds like, as I said, banking, modern banking sounds the best of both worlds. Depositors get a very good return. Instead of keeping my money under my pillow, I deposit it in a bank. I don't have to worry. I get a rate of return and I have peace of mind. I can take my money back whenever I want. Businesses get long-term finance. I want to set up a power plant. I want to set up a thermal plant, fertilizer plant. I also get money for a long term. And the bank makes money. So depositors are happy. Businesses are happy. Bank is happy. So what really is the problem? The problem, as I said, underlying all financial markets is risk. That really is a problem. So let me now talk about the types of risks. I think I'm good enough for time. So I'll try and uh, maybe go a little faster because in order to cover my slides, okay? So I think well, I'm at 17, I think out of 38. So I might go a little faster. We can address question and answers at the end if necessary. So what are the types of risks? So essentially four different kinds of risks. The first, as I said, is a credit risk. The risk that the borrower may not prove creditworthy. And as a result, he doesn't repay the loan that he has given. Now, this might be all right if the bank had lent, say, in the case of a housing loan. So the bank has given against a housing loan. He has a security of the house. And normally, at least in the past, the value of the house used to keep appreciating. Today, that may not be so. So the value of the house may be less than the amount of the loan that you have given. But in many other cases, today, for instance, if you try to sell a power plant or a thermal plant or a fertilizer plant, you might find that there are really no takers. So the first risk really is a risk that the borrower may not repay. Now, he could be a willful defaulter. We'll go into that a little later, but right now I'm just focusing on the credit risk, okay? So the, now I'll go to the interest rate risk. What is the interest rate risk? The interest rate risk is that during the period of the contract of your loan, the interest rate might have changed. It might have gone up, it might have gone down, in which case if I've given a loan at 10% at a fixed rate for a long tenure, and subsequently interest rates have gone up to say 15%, then as a bank, I'm really in a dilemma because I now have to be able to source money. And in order to, I still have to charge the borrower only 10%. But today I have to pay the depositor a much higher rate of, in, give him much a higher rate of interest. So interest rate fluctuation also exposes the bank to interest rate risk. Typically this happens when interest rates are fixed. When you have floating rates, now in India, most loans are floating rate, but unfortunately deposits are still on fixed rate. I think all of us as savers and depositors are not yet ready to accept floating rates of interest. So except in the case of Government of India loans, in the case of, sorry, Government of India bonds, which are now moved to floating rate, bank deposits are still on fixed rate of interest. So which is why you have interest rate risk. Then you also have operational risk. The risk, of course, I said, this is very simple, that in case the operations of the bank itself are hindered, you know, you can have a cyclone, you can have like, now you're having Chennai, Chennai is now facing a cyclone. So you could have an operational risk. A bank could, a branch could be wiped out and go, go underwater, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we have a terrible thought of a terrorist strike. Hopefully it will not happen. Then you have the liquidity risk. This, I think, along with the credit risk and the liquidity risk is what I'm going to focus on. And this is the risk. The bank is not able to meet its obligations to its depositors and when they demand, simply because that on the lending side, that is the asset side, they don't have enough liquid funds to meet their depositors' requirements. So now I'm going to, as I said, focus on credit risk primarily and liquidity, because when we talk about the banking sector, these are the two most important as far as for our common understanding. This, as I said, is a risk that the borrower does not repay. It could be deliberate. It could be a willful default. We've heard of many cases where borrowers take money. They have the funds, they've taken the money and they build Taj Mahal somewhere, but they're not willing to repay the bank. So this is what is known as willful default. It could also be as a result of poor business decisions. Maybe he, he entered an area which he should not have entered. He did not know that the Chinese are manufacturing the same item at a fraction of the price. So it, you know, you have a question of business decision which was made wrong. It could be because of external factors, because as I said, the US Fed, for instance, now is hiking interest rates. Suddenly you find that the borrower has to pay a much higher, higher rate of interest if it is on a floating rate interest basis, or it could be because of force major factors like what happened with COVID. 
as we saw with covid virtually the entire economy and the global economy as well as domestic economy came to a standstill so this is something that is entirely beyond the borrower's control there's nothing he could do however honest however sincere and however much he meant to repay the loan so this is the kind of credit risk very briefly so what happens when borrowers default banks have the op they have the opportunity of course of falling back on the security or the collateral that they have taken but very often you will find that the collateral value has eroded or basically there are no takers even though the value on paper may be very high ultimately the value of something is what the market will give you so today when you want to sell a house in fact you have found that there are very prime houses in bombay huge houses on prime real estate that nobody wants simply because this might sound ironical but simply because people know that how will i be able to maintain that house so the value could have eroded no maybe maybe nobody is interested so as a result of which banks will have to do this what they call write off that means they'll have to say okay this loan is not going to come back ye wapas nahi aane wala so they'll have to take a hit from the, on their profits and they'll have to write off the loan as a result if you have all your loans become non performing and then they write off then again you'll have a bank failure and you could have a run on banks interest rate risk as i said i'm not going to elaborate on this you can perhaps very quickly read it I, i've already spoken about it a little bit so in the interest of time i'm proceeding further and i've talked about how interest rates affect banks this again as i said interest rate volatility does affect banks so let's forget about that for the moment so let me focus on liquidity risks Look, as i said in the case of banking what is unique about banking as against non bank financial institutions is that the depositors are allowed to withdraw their deposits on demand they can use their money as and when they feel like so the bank has no idea when is the depositor going to come to the bank and demand their money back they have no idea whether inflows because after all banks also every day there are fresh deposits coming in and there are outflows also but the bank really has no idea whether the inflows of the day are going to be enough to match the outflows of the day so you have complete uncertainty as far as inflows and outflows on a day to day basis are concerned so the bank has a serious problem of liquidity and this is a huge risk so why is this a risk in the case of banks because there's just no way the bank can refuse to pay a deposit he can he can't tell a deposit are mere paas aaj paisa nahi hai aap kal wapas aa jao ya ek ghante ke baad wapas aa jao you as a depositor will not be willing to take that answer so, but the problem is as i said all the money the banks might have lent out they might have lent out on a longer term basis precisely because of which the banks have to keep some amount of funds in liquid form the question is how much the question is in what form and this is where we talk about regulation etc and the central bank or the regulatory authority will specify but the bank even if there was not a regulator and this is an important point that i'm making that even if you did not have a regulator specifying that you keep a certain amount of money what arun spoke about the cash reserve ratio even if you did not have a regulator saying that this is your cash reserve ratio or crr banks themselves would keep some amount of cash with them they would also keep bank money with the reserve bank of india but the reserve bank of india does not pay interest on this cash reserve ratio so that is basically an idle asset so it hurts banks the, to to the extent that they keep idle assets they're losing out the opportunity to lend it and earn some return on it they could also make arrangements to withdraw from other banks that is where interbank lending and borrowing comes in but this could be expensive because today when i need money and i go to my friendly neighborhood bank that suddenly friendly bank turns very unfriendly and says sorry buddy you want money but i want profits too so i'm going to charge you a very high rate of interest so that is why these interbank arrangements there is a cost to them depending on what the interbank rate of interest will be they could also invest in what are called liquid assets government of india bonds which is why rbi also specifies what is known as slr or statutory liquidity ratio they specifies what percentage of banks total deposits must be kept in the form of statutory liquidity yeah we fact forms which is essentially government of india bonds because these are readily liquid there's always a market for government of india bonds so if your cash that you have on hand is not enough if your crr is not enough if your friendly neighborhood bank has suddenly become unfriendly and refuses to give you money you can always liquidate your holding of government of india bonds your slr you will of course default but that is a separate story and in and pay your depositor this is why because of all these factors that i have listed because essentially because of credit risk risk and the other risks but i said
Uh, you are muted, ma'am. Please unmute. Uh, you are muted. Please unmute, ma'am, again. Yeah, I am unmuted. I don't know how yeah. I became muted. But I think the administrator muted everybody, including me. Okay. So I think now I've unmuted myself. So I hope you heard me. So, so I said, because of all these risks, you need a regulator. You need a supervisor. Because as I said, the risks are not only of liquidity, credit, interest rate, operational. But because banking, as I said, is a very risky business. And not only is it a risky business, you are playing, taking risks with other people's money. See, I decide to take my money and just throw it from the top of a skyscraper. That's my money. I can do whatever I want. I may be foolish. I mean, you might write me off as completely insane, but that's a different matter. But what do banks do? They are take, taking risks with other people's money. As you know, in the case of banks, the equity is a very small portion of banks' funds. Banks are essentially taking risks, playing gaming the system, take gambling really in another way with other people's money. And because banks are doing this with other people's money, you need a regulator who will specify what are the kind of rules under which banks will operate. Further, when they have introduced these rules, they will supervise these banks to ensure that they are not jumping the traffic light as it were. So there are two terms just very specific to banking in the context of banking risk. One is what is known as moral hazard, and the other is what is known as too big to fail. Now, what is moral hazard? Moral hazard is, the, as I said, the tendency that I explained to you earlier of banks to go in for riskier and riskier borrowers because higher the risk, the higher the rate of interest that I can charge them. So there is this underwritten, unstated tendency of banks to keep going and lending money to riskier and riskier borrowers. And the bank really doesn't bother because why? It's not the bank's money. It is your money, my money. So there is this innate tendency of banks to go in for riskier and riskier loans, riskier and riskier borrowers, to whom I can charge a higher rate of interest because other things remaining the same. This is a term that economists are very fond of. Ceteris paribus means other things remaining the same. And economists, as I told you, tend to live a little bit in cloud cuckoo land. Nothing in the real world really is ever the same. But economists like to make these assumptions that other things remaining the same, the riskier the borrower, the higher the spread, the higher my profit. So this, as I said, is what is known as moral hazard, the tendency to give riskier and riskier borrowers loans. But as I said, because, uh, why is this not moving down? Just a moment. Just a moment, let me see why my screen is not moving down. Okay, okay, yeah. So the next term that I talked about is too big to fail. What is too big to fail? Too big to fail relates to the inevitability of bank, of bank rescues. What is the inevitability? Because whenever a large enough bank fails, governments invariably come to their rescue and rescue with taxpayer money. So this is what makes banking particularly critical because not only are banks taking riskier and riskier propositions with other people's money, but when they fail, invariably governments all over the world come to the rescue of these banks, prevent them from failing. With whose money? Not with government's money either, with taxpayer money. That means your and my money. So the public really, we're really being gamed on two fronts. One, the bank is taking risks with our money. And when the bank goes down, the government rescues these very same banks who need to be penalized again, once again, with our money. So this term, adverse, too big to fail, this is what gives rise, in fact, to the adverse selection, the moral hazard. That is a tendency of banks to give excess risks take excessive risk. In fact, the 2008 crisis caused precisely because of this. Banks knew they were lending to people whom they should not have lent to, but they also knew at the back of their mind that the government, the US government, the US Fed would come to their rescue if and when the bank failed. And remember, this is important to note that this rescue happens regardless of whether the bank is a public sector bank or a private sector bank. Invariably, when there's a threat of the bank going down, governments all over the world do give, do, one minute, yes, yeah, uh, so I think it's gone back to the middle, to the beginning, let me just go back to where I was, oh, okay, okay, okay. so what are the consequences, now, as I said, bank, governments come to the rescue of banks, so they have come to the, to, they 
automatically rush to rescue banks. Why, why did they do this? Because what are the consequences of bank failure? The consequences are dramatic, as we saw in the 2008 crisis. But let me explain the modalities, the process in which this happens. Because the banks, as I told you, because of the ability to create credit, multiple expansion of credit, they are the very backbone of the financial system. For every 100 rupees of bank deposits, they can create 100x by way of bank credit. So failure of one bank, if large enough, as can be disastrous for the entire banking system, because through the interbank dependency, that means one bank would have lent to another bank, that bank might have lent to or borrowed to another bank. If one bank goes down, and if it is a large enough bank, then through the interbank transactions, the entire banking system can collapse. And hence, as I said, become bailouts become a matter of course. Whether the bank is a public sector or a bank, private sector bank, Banking bailout is inevitable if it is a large enough bank. The alternative, as I said, is to invite economic disaster. And this is what we saw happen in the, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, when the US government thought that, look, this is really very bad. Banks are able to arm twist us like this. So let, let us allow Lehman to go down. So they allowed Lehman to go down because they said, this cannot be an open-ended kind of you know, offer to the banks that you can do whatever you want. You lend to all subprime borrowers. And then when you go down, we come to your rescue. So the US government took a calculated call. Obviously, it miscalculated, as we see in hindsight. And so they allowed Lehman to go down. And then we saw not only did the US economy come, come down, but the entire world economy collapsed. Because of this, now banks and regulators, there's, it is very important for them to regulate and supervise banks and financial markets, not retro, retrospectively, but proactively. The moment you know there's any sign of trouble in a bank, you immediately have to step in to ensure that you nip the problem in the bud. So this is where supervision becomes very important. Because unless you know what is the health of a bank, is it in danger of going down, you will not be able to intervene in time. So what is the kind of regulatory framework that you have to ensure that the banking system, the economy, and the global economy is safe? So you have everywhere you have a regulatory framework. What is the kind of regulatory framework? The first framework is that you have something known as a, you lay down financial parameters. You specify how much capital should the bank bring, should the promoters bring in. Capital is what the promoters bring in, whereas the rest of the business is funded through deposits. So capital shows how much skin in the game the promoters have. Higher the capital, the more careful they will be. If I'm going to start a business entirely with your money, I will take maximum amount of risks. But if I'm going to start a business only with my own money, I will be much, much more careful. So the proportion of promoters' own funds to depositors' funds is very critical. So this is what is known as a capital adequacy ratio. You might have heard this term that RBI specify what is known as a capital adequacy ratio, which is about 8 to 9% in the Indian context. How much of capital must the promoters bring in? What is the kind of liquidity ratio they should have? What is the kind of various other ratios the regulator specifies? What is the second level of regulation? The second level of regulation is licensing. You may be surprised to know that at a time when we moved in 1991 to the reform, the economic reform process, the one sector which continues to be licensed, and there is no talk of making it unlicensed. And this is so even in the most uh, market-friendly economy in the world, US, if I may say so, there also banking is a licensed activity. And all regulators lay down who will own a bank. And what they do is they find out who is fit and proper. Unfortunately or fortunately, they never specify what does the word fit mean? What does the word proper mean? And this has been a big bone of contention in the Indian context because large corporate houses, the Tata's, Reliance, Ambani, Adani, they all want to enter banking business. It's very easy to understand why they want to enter banking business because they get access to so much money, other people's money, with which they can do well, not whatever they want, but virtually it is their money, right? So corporate houses in India have been pushing very hard against you know, the Reserve Bank of India and to some extent government of India to let corporate houses enter banks, get licenses for banks. Fortunately for us, the Reserve Bank of India has stood very firm against enormous pressure. I hope you can understand what I mean when I say enormous pressure, because you know the power of large corporate houses in a democracy. So they have been pushing very hard to enter the banking business. But as of now, fortunately for us, the Reserve Bank has said, corporate houses will not be allowed to enter banking. 
though they have not really specified this in so many words, the fact is that whenever corporate houses try, for one reason or the other, the Reserve Bank of India does not give them a license. And this is the understated, unstated reason that they do not want corporates to enter banking because that could be the edge of the precipice. So the Reserve Bank of India says that we will see who is fit and proper. And fortunately for us, they have not seen corporate houses to be fit and proper. Not that we have anything against corporate houses, not that we are casting aspersions on them, but the here is the term fit and proper is fit and proper to start a bank. Because as I said, banking is a risky business. Banking is playing risks with other people's money. The Reserve Bank of India and regulators all over the world do not allow corporates to enter the business of banking. Regulation doesn't stop there. They define what kind of business can you do. So typically, banks are not allowed to play the stock market. There are very severe limits on the kind of money banks can invest in the stock market, how much money banks can give customers again to invest in the stock market. So this is in order to ensure that the activities that they undertake with your money, my money, is not excessively risky. Because as we all know, the stock market is a market which is much more about risks. Banks are what are known as fixed income markets. They give you a particular rate of return, regardless of what business they indulge in. Regardless of the kind of risks that they engage in, they have to give the depositors whatever rate of interest that they have agreed to give in the beginning. So then you have supervision to ensure that banks are always able to pay their depositors as and when they require. So there are two words that are very important in this. That means banks must always be able to pay their depositors Secondly, as and when depositors want, not when the bank wants. So this is very quickly, I'm just talking in the Indian context. I think I'd like to leave more time for question and answer, so I'm rushing through this. In the Indian context, we also have what is known as a schedule and non scheduled banks. So only banks that meet certain criteria, does the Reserve Bank of India include them in the what is known as a second schedule or the Reserve Bank of India Act. And being allowed to be a scheduled bank gives you access to certain facilities from the Reserve Bank of India Hence the importance of being a scheduled bank. This is something I think I've talked about, who can be promoters. Then the Reserve Bank doesn't stop with just saying who can be promoters. They also say that what is your voting power? So even if you can have, if you are a promoter with 40% share, you cannot exercise 40% of voting power. The Reserve Bank has different strictures about voting power. You can have, you know, in everywhere in the corporate world, if I own 10% shares in a company, I have 10% voting power. And that is how it should be, right? But in the case of banks, the RBI says, okay, buddy, you might be having 20, 10, 20% of the bank you might be owning, but you cannot have 20% voting power. Voting power is restricted to much less. That keeps changing and is not of interest to this particular audience. So I'm not going into the details. So they have, they have restrictions on who can be promoters, who can be dominant shareholders. There are restrictions on voting power. You have public sector banks. And then you have the question is, does ownership make a difference? As I said, these are the issues. These are the various statutes. As I said, this again is a matter of detail. So I'm not going into this. Banks in India, this again is a matter of, I think more of current interest in case of those of you who want to know what is the structure of the banking sector in India. So this is how it is. Public sector banks are no longer 27, my mistake over there. They have, because we've had some mergers that is, a, I took it from one of my earlier slides, my apologies for that. So let me now go to Diamond and Digwick's contribution. So the basic thing for which they've got the Nobel Prize is a 1983 paper, which is called Bank Runs, Deposit Insurance and Liquidity. So this really focused, this paper focused on maturity transformation. It makes banks particularly vulnerable. What they said is that this maturity transformation makes banks particularly vulnerable, even to a rumor. See, it's not, it's not necessary that I go to the bank and actually try to withdraw money. If I have sufficiently nasty intentions, I will just create a rumor, float a rumor, saying, oh, X bank, I went to X bank and I was tried to withdraw my money. I could not withdraw my money. I had to kind of, you know, come away with, without my money and that bank doesn't have enough funds. So even a rumor is enough to make a bank particularly vulnerable about the collapse of the bank. If many savers, as I said, start pulling out their money at the same time, we could, the rumor itself could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It could lead to a run in the bank, raising the specter of its eventual collapse. This, that the, what is the remedy to this? So Diamond and Dribbick suggested a remedy. They said the government can, and the central bank can do something known as deposit insurance. What is deposit insurance? By telling the depositor that your deposit is insured, even if the bank goes down under, you will get your money back. 
But the problem with this is that you cannot possibly insure all the money, right? The cost of insurance will become very, very high. At the same time, there's another downside is that if I in insure all the money, then that again creates a moral hazard. The bank will feel, look, all the money is insured, regardless of what I do, if I'm not able to pay the depositor, there's an insurance company which is willing to repay the depositor. So why should I be careful? So deposit insurance is a double-edged sword. Even though you have deposit insurance in order to insure, tell the depositor, don't worry, if the bank goes down, we will give you your money back. It is a double-edged sword because the bank feels that if the deposit is controlled, I need not take care which is why everywhere you'll find that deposit insurance is a limit. In India, the limit was about 1 lakh plus two years ago. Now the government has raised it to 5 lakhs. Most of us, fortunately, in this audience, perhaps have money that would be a lucky few in this country who have bank deposits of much more than 5 lakhs. So we can perhaps justify, we say, ki lakh se kya hoga? Kya guzara hoga? but the fact is that we are a poor country and this limit of 5 lakhs can, covers the bulk of the depositors, not the deposits in the bank, right? So this is why governments everywhere set a limit which might seem unfair to you and I, but it is fair when you look at the context in which it is given. And then you also have, as I said, you have the lender of last resort because the banks can always turn to the Reserve Bank of India or the central bank. So these are the two remedies suggested by D and D, D squared for a mathematical audience and scientific audience. So you have the D squared suggested that you have deposit insurance and you have a lender of last resort, the central bank. So this is what they gave, the prize has been given to them for suggesting these two remedies. But as I said, these remedies are not foolproof, but these were remedies suggested by them. And this has been implemented by governments and banks, all central banks all over the world. Today, we do have deposit insurance all over the world. We do have a lender of last resort. What was Bernanke's contribution, Bernanke's contribution? As Arun said, his major contribution was he analyzed what happened in the 1930s depression. And he analyzed that because banks failed, because you had bank runs, they made the Great Depression much worse. So he said, whenever banks tend to are going down, whenever there's a danger to banks, then central banks must come to their rescue. And he used this learning in the 2008 crisis by rushing to the rescue of banks, of course, after they failed to rescue Lehman, he came to the rescue of banks and we did, and the central bank in, our, in, in USA, the US Federal Reserve did what is known as quantitative easing. That means they just flooded the system with liquidity, printed money because they felt it's much, much more important for the banks to somehow keep stay afloat. Today, of course, we can argue that, you know, as so should Bernanke, as uh, in fact, Arun said that he was, you know, everybody praised him. In fact, it was not just Bernanke, there were three of them, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, and Larry Summers. I think there was Time, Time Magazine, or I think Economist, who at one point of time, they, in two, after 2008 crisis, they actually had a cover, which was called the trio who saved the world. Today, one can call back that, you know, that cover story and say, did they really save the world? Or did they temporarily save the world? And today, are we much worse off because they rushed to rescue the banks in the way they, they did? Because you could argue today that many of the problems stem from the fact that they flooded their system with liquidity. They kept monetary policy too loose, as a result of which the Fed had to start reversing the low interest rate regime. At a time, then COVID also hit. So a combination of factors resulted in the fact that you had too much money and you had inflation and COVID, the same parallels with the Indian situation that too, soon after the 2008 crisis, the Reserve Bank of India also eased liquidity. We had too much money floating around. Again, then COVID unfortunately hit into, in 2020. So the Reserve Bank of India, before they could start tightening liquidity because inflation had become very high during the time of Raghuram Rajan and Ujit Patel, they had started tightening liquidity. Then COVID hit. So RBI again had to do massive liquidity easing. And now we are again facing the problem of inflation because we really have too much money and we have supply bottlenecks. So hopefully, this brings me to the last of my slides. Hopefully, we have learned our lessons, but this is the real world till the next crisis comes along. So that is how it, the situation is today. We have learned some lessons, not all lessons, because as Arun said, we now have the cryptocurrencies coming up. So we really have a situation where Central banks no longer really control the money supply in the economy because there are many players with crypto assets saying that we don't need central bank money. We will create our own money. So we really do not know what the implications of crypto assets will be. 
So as I said, we have learned our lessons till the next crisis come along, comes along. So hopefully we'll be a little better equipped. So how much better equipped can we avert the next crisis, I think is a very big question mark. So with that, I'll stop now and I'm completely open, as I said, to questions. I will correct that picture about public sector banks. I'll tell you what the number is right now post the government mergers. So with that, I'm stopping my screen scaring and I'm completely open to questions now. Please let me know. Arun? Very nice talk <coughs> and very clear. So I have half, I think I have enough time and more for Q&A, yeah. so please let me know. And as I said, I'm a journalist, so there are no holy cows. So please don't hesitate. Any questions, every question, I'm completely open. You may not be satisfied with my reply because you must remember that I'm talking about economics and finance, which contrary to what Arun will say, or he might agree with me actually, though, because though Arun has a physics background, fortunately for all of, for me at least, he subsequently also studied economics and even more fortunately went to JNU. So he knows that economics is a far from precise number science, unlike physical sciences, where you can go to a laboratory and do, you know, add one chemical, another chemical and laboratory conditions, you get a very exact outcome. In the real world, we're dealing with human beings. And though econ economists love, one of the basic assumptions of economics really is of rationality. But thank God for it, I would say, human beings are not rational. We are highly irrational. We keep changing our minds almost from moment to moment. And that's what leads to creativity. So economics is really not a physical science. It is not an exact science, which is why when economics first came and Adam Smith talked about it, he talked about the moral sentiments and he called it political economy. Because whatever choices RBI, government of India takes, you are also bearing in mind that whatever decisions you take, you're impacting the lives of ordinary human beings. And there's no counterfactual to it. If today we have high inflation, particularly led by food inflation, it is hurting the poor in this country where it hurts the most. So Arun now, I think thanks to JNU, he knows that you know the physics and the exactitude of the physics that he brought in is now kind of being tempered by JNU. And the fact that you know the poor in this country, the decision of what to do about inflation is a political economy question. In a democracy, whether it is the people who vote for you, and particularly the poor who vote in much larger numbers and the rich, you cannot afford to ignore inflation. So, so whatever economics might tell you about too much money, how you need to tighten interest rates, you need to bear in mind that ultimately what you need to do, you need to do what is going to help people. So with that last salvo from me, I'm completely open to set questions, please. So Dr. Nishima Mangu, uh, Mangu will coordinate the question answer session. Yeah. And this one question, I just managed to check the number of public sector banks is actually now 12, not 27 the government actually went into a number of mergers. The state bank, associate banks were merged with State Bank of India. A number of other banks were also merged. So I'll correct that slide and send it back to you, send it to you. But please, sorry, let me know. Yeah. Thank you, know, you so much, ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. So now we can take up uh, some questions. Uh, Professor Guman has raised his hand. Uh, sir, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I really enjoyed uh, your uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. I was very simple and straight. Am I audible? Yes, Absolutely. yes. Please. Yes. Yeah. My 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 question is that uh, you were uh, having uh, said you have said that corporate sector is not allowed by RPI so far. Uh, license banking licensing is concerned. Right. Uh, my 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 two questions are: even if they are fulfilling the conditions. If so, and it's a market-driven economy, it's a market paradigm which is dominating at present, how long RBI can continue to say no to the corporate sector not to enter in the uh, banking business? Thank you, ma'am. Well, Professor, should I take a number of questions? Arun, you want me to take a number of questions and answer one by one? I think we can take a few more questions. So oh. there is a question from sure. Professor Ronki Ram, how to ensure scam-free scam -free. transactions? <laughs> if only we knew the answer to that. How do we ensure scam-free transactions? I think, you know, unless you do something about human greed, and if we didn't have human greed, then there would be no incentive to move ahead. Unless all of us wish to better our economic status, nobody would really work hard. If you all assume, which is basically why I think, I don't know whether Arun would agree with me, given his JNU background, but this is why Marxism really failed. 
Because if you look at Marxism on paper, it's such a wonderful theory. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. What could be better than that? But the problem is that if I felt that I'm going to work very hard, but I'm only going to get as much money as my neighbor who doesn't do anything at all, then where is the incentive for me to work? So as long as you are, if you don't have human greed, you won't have the incentive to work. And if you don't have human greed, you will not find people trying to game the system. So I think this is why I think you can never do away with financial scams. But what you need to do really is ensure that regulation and supervision is so sharp that you moment you find somebody deviating, you catch hold of him and penalize him very, you know, very harshly. So that he never takes chances with it again. The problem in our system is that A, we catch the crooks much too late after they have fled the country in many cases. Two, we do not give exemplary punishment. So why would anybody do any, no, not try to scam? So this is the problem. We saw in the case of cryptocurrency, I don't want to name anybody, but uh, and, uh, last year there were so many ads on television channels from crypto exchanges. And the promoter of one of the crypto exchanges is today sitting in Dubai. He says, I have not done anything at all. I'm still promoting ex a cryptocurrency, but I prefer to be in Dubai. Why? If I have nothing to hide, why don't I stay in my own country? But this is, as I said, you will never have an end to scams, scams as long as there is greed. Human greed is important. It is necessary, but only up to a point. So this really is a problem. There is no end to scams. The only solution really is not a complete solution is to crack down on the moment you see anybody trying to game the system unfairly and you give such exemplary punishment. So the neighbor thinks twice before he does the thing. We've seen it in the case of traffic signals also, right? When there's a red light and who there's, see there's no cop, everybody jumps a traffic signal, which is why now, thanks to technology, it is possible for the policeman, he need not catch you. He just takes a picture of your number plate and you get a chalan by email. So this is what is necessary, that you get such a severe punishment that you think twice, I want to be rich. Of course, I want to be rich. Who doesn't want to be rich? But I will do it within the four pillars of the legal framework. So that's why, sorry, no end to scams. Scams will happen. They make life interesting, make life exciting. But as long as we have humans, as long as we have greed, you need just smarter regulation. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, there's another question by sure. Professor Arun Kumar. What of crony capitalism and banks? <laughs> well, uh, as I said, when the, the moment you say talk of capitalism, the sad part is that capitalism, crony capitalism have almost become, you know, together, they can almost, I wouldn't say synonymous, but they almost go together because it is large businesses who really are in a, in a position to create the kind of investments that you need to really grow. But what you really need to ensure that this power is restricted to the corporate world and they don't ensure that this paper idealistic even in the US, we've seen corporates play a very big role. In fact, in the US, corporates directly pay money to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. We, of course, have a bit of the sham of electoral bonds, which again is a way of funding political parties. So I think as long as you have democracies and you need democracy willing to give it up, it is the worst form, the worst of the it's the least bad form of governance. Right? We all want democracies. Unfortunately, political parties need funding. So unless we can think of a system where all of us are going to find corporates funding political parties, either under the table or above the table. So the link between capitalism and cronyism, I think, is something that is, uh, you know, inevitable. The answer to that, I think, is a smart and vigilant civil society, smart and vigilant media, smart and vigilant judicial system. Unfortunately, in India, all these are not where they should be, including the media, which I am a part. So I think this is what we really need to do. We need to ensure that cloning capitalism does not work to our disadvantage. It works only to our advantage. Let them invest, let them build power plants, sports, let them give jobs to everybody in this country, but let them not influence political decision-making in their favor. I don't know, Arun, does that, does that sound too idealistic, even by your idealistic standards, Arun? No, I, I, I think, Maitri, you're right. There's no shortcut but public accountability. Uh, so we, how do we build public accountability? That is a critical question. Uh, and that will only come through socioeconomic movements. I had an article recently uh, in the leaflet in which I pointed out 
that in India, democracy came to a country which is very feudal, and we're still very feudal. So therefore, the power of feudalism undermines democracy. So our democracy is becoming like a shell. And within that, crony capitalism will thrive. So I think it's an issue of you know, uh, uh, how do we create movements so that public becomes aware and demands accountability. Okay. One question. I, I, I want to ask one question. Can I, just, can I just respond to Arun? I would agree yeah. with you, Arun, but for the Himachal results. What the Himachal results have shown us is our democracy, whatever you may say, it's very flawed in many, many ways, but it's vibrant and is alive because Himachal is a state which has a very small minority community. Despite that, we have seen the Congress coming back to power. So what you need in a democracy is you need ideally why you know you need strong opponents you don't you need to have you don't have one strong political party calling all the shots so i'm very heartened by the himachal results because that shows that democracy is alive and well in a country that is so poor in a country that i will agree is largely feudal and here let me display my parochial roots and say feudalism is frankly sorry largely a characteristic of the north india not of south india this is partly because you know social movements have taken form much earlier, particularly in Tamil Nadu. So actually, you will find that you can almost draw a line in India across the middle, and you'll find feudalism is much more typical of the north, much less typical of the south, because social churn has happened in the south. It is happening in the north. So after the Himachal results, I will not buy your argument that feudalism is flawed. I mean, that democracy in our country is flawed. It's flawed in many ways, but I'm very, very heartened by the results of Himachal because we need strong opposition. That is really the answer to a good democracy. Sorry, next question, Nishima. Uh, sorry, I think we wanted to ask. Yeah. Professor Guman's question, please. Please, please, sorry. No, Professor Guman had asked a question that still remains. I, I first question. That. What, what was that? Uh, that, that? That was that the corporate sector is not. Yeah, yeah, sorry, allowed. sorry. Yeah. Yes, I, yeah, sorry. My, my apologies, Professor Guman. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. I but think the, the patient space. <laughs> no, sorry. I, I don't know whether my answer will you know, kind of warrant your patience. But the thing is, as I said, as I said, once again, this is very heartening because though we talk about corruption, lack of values, and et cetera in India, you can imagine the kind of pressures that the central bank and government have been facing in order to allow corporates to enter. But so far they have resisted and I hope they continue to resist simply because even though we talk about free market capitalism, market being a check, we know that the market is not a very good instrument. The market always needs to be corrected, but the market, we can do that correction only after the mistakes have happened. So that is why I think it's very important that we tell corporates, you're welcome to raise your money. Please raise it in the stock market. How, float an IPO because the person who goes to the stock market, he goes in knowing that there are risks in the banking sector because of the backing of the Reserve Bank of India and because you have a lender of last resort, you have a tacit implicit guarantee that taxpayer money will come to your support. We need to be much, much more careful as far as banks are concerned. Unlike the stock market where typically only the rich go to the stock market, the poor go to banks. So you, it is important that your social contract ensures that you protect the poor much more than you protect the rich. The rich can take care of themselves. Believe me, all the people who are today invested in the stock market go there only because they're in a position to take the losses. Nobody who goes to the stock market or should go to the stock market. Today you have auto, today you have auto rickshaw wallahs going to the stock market because the stock, they think the stock market is a one-way street. The stock market is not a one-way street. The auto rickshaw wala should not go to the stock market. And if he is going to learn only through his own mistakes, and the only answer I can give is what my former editor Swami, Swaminathan Ankleshwaraya used to say. All of you must have read his, uh, you know, Swaminamis column. He used to say the fool and his money should be quickly parted, deserve to be parted. So that is what is necessary. We need to give financial literacy. And this is where I think ventures like yours are very important. Because I think when you explain the practical meaning of what this Nobel Prize means, what do banks really do? I hope the understanding of finance spreads much larger, much more, you know, across the board as far as this is concerned. Okay, my batteries. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was a very, very valid point. Uh, Dharamvi, sir, wanted to ask a question, I think. Sir, if you are there. 
I think he got disconnected. Yeah, I think he has got disconnected. Okay, no problem. So, uh, uh, Anuji, is there any question on Facebook? If we can no take questions it? on Facebook. No. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I'll proceed to the vote of thanks. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I take this distinct opportunity in acknowledging my utmost sincere thanks to Miss Maithili, ma'am a renowned journalist and consulting editor, The Economic Times, for her highly informative, inspiring and scintillating talk on understanding the economics, Nobel, how does it impact our lives? And she has very clearly explained to even those like me from a science background who doesn't know anything about money and banks. Now I can say that I know a bit about banks also. Please join me in passing a hearty vote of thanks to the learned speaker for her highly stimulating and trend-setting talk. I'm extremely thankful to Professor Arun Kumar, Makum Edisasia, Chair Professor, Institute of Social Sciences, New Delhi, and Professor Economics, JNU Delhi, for accepting our request to be the guest of honor of this superb and memorable talk and sparing his valuable moments with us this morning, and also for rescheduling his flight to be with us today. I'm also thankful to Professor Sanjeev K. Sharma, founder UIAMS Punjab University Chandigarh and Professor Vinod Chaudhary, Department of Sociology Punjab University Chandigarh for being with us today in this lecture. Thank you, sir. I'm falling short of words in expressing my gratitude to Professor Arun Kumar Grover, Vice President of SPSTI, who has been untiringly working for the dissemination of knowledge through these lectures and also for merging all the academics together for this meaningful series. I'm also thankful to Mr. Dharamveer, IAS and President, Society for Promotion of Science and Technology in India, Professor R.K. Kohli, Chairman, Chandigarh Chapter of NASI, and Professor Anand Pajava, Chandigarh Chapter of INSA, and also Professor K.K. Basin, Secretary, NASI, Chandigarh Chapter. Last but not the least, I am grateful to Professor Mrs. Kia Dharamveer, General Secretary, SPSTI, and her very, very dedicated team comprising of Mr. Anuj Goel, Mr. Ma Mahi Paul, Dr. Fatima Goshia, and Ms. Rajni Bhalla for organizing the event in a perfect manner and for their untiring efforts. Lastly, on behalf of SPSTI, INSA, INYAS, NASI, NCSTC, senior colleagues and all invitees, I would like to mention that we are all most grateful to Ms. Maithili Ma'am for being with us this morning for such a uh, educative and scholarly talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am. Thank you very much. The pleasure has been mine. And thank you very much for starting this wonderful venture. I learned a little bit about science. You must remember <laughs> the Nobel has three, three prizes with a science background and only peace, literature, and economics, which have a non-scientific in my sailor. <laughs> so I learned a little bit of science from all of you. And I didn't know about this venture until Arun Kumar told me about it. It's a great venture. And I've been telling others about it also. Thank you very much once again. So thank you, ma'am. <laughs> So our next lecture is on the vision of Laksha University to be given by Vice Chancellor Professor Rudra Pratap, who comes from, who came as the first Vice Chancellor of Laksha University on deputation from Indian Institute of Science Bangalore. So he's going to talk to us on vision for Plaksha University. Plaksha University is a new university in Mohali on the lines of a university for liberal arts, which is the Ashoka University at Son Sonipat. Plaksha has recently entered into an MOU with Aiza Mohali, and we are looking forward to these universities in the private sector as in the state sector work together for promoting our region as an educational hub and innovation hub for Northwest of India. So I am particularly oh, um, excited about listening to Professor Vudra Pratap next week on so this December, is on 24th, 24th. December 24th at 11 a.m. on Saturday. This lecture was to, commem is to commemorate National Mathematics Day, which actually falls on December 22nd, which is Ramanujan's birthday. But Professor Rudra Pratap has to go for a meeting on 22nd. So we have, at his request, we have postponed this lecture from December 22nd to December 24, 2022. So see you all on December 24th, and thank you very much for joining. Thank you.